SCP-610-L2. During construction of the perimeter surrounding SCP-610's containment area, several Class D personnel were infected due to assaults from infected villagers or animals roaming the area in addition to a number of infections as a result of escape attempts and careless behavior. Most of these infected personnel were immediately destroyed with flamethrowers. However, a small collection of infected were contained in cold storage units, which prolonged the inevitable progression of SCP-610's mutative properties. The decision was made to utilize some of these infected personnel as video relays and dispatch them into nearby sites. Due to the concern over loss of equipment as evidenced in SCP-610-L1, all three subjects that were used in this manner were sent in with a single video system to Site C. Additional equipment issued for this dispatch include a one-gallon container of gasoline, three emergency flares, three 9mm pistols with three magazines of ammo each, three single-serving food rations. The infected personnel were instructed to observe and avoid interaction with the infected villagers as long as possible, but should a situation arise where they are met with aggression, or feel they are losing themselves to SCP-610's influence, they are free to kill as many infected villagers as they so choose, and do as much damage to infected objects and property as possible while maintaining video feed. The intent of this order was to provide data of SCP-610 infected communities in a raid situation so a plan of eradication could be better established. At the time of this expedition, Site C was suspected to be a possible origin point for SCP-610, having far fewer mobile infected than other sites, as well as structures which appear to have been layered over several times with the terraforming effects of the immobile infected. Dispatched Class D personnel, known henceforth as DI-1, DI-2, and DI-3, were directed to pay particular attention to anything that could be considered an origin point for SCP-610. The trek from our perimeter camp to Site C was uneventful. There is no evidence of any native animal life in the area. As Site C is approached, there is a noticeable rise in the temperature within the last 30 meters of the trip that necessitates removal of the heavy cold-based coverings that were provided. The temperature rises again sharply at the entrance to Site C proper, which requires a further shedding of garments for fear of heat stroke. Temperatures within Site C are described as being heavily humid and around 32 degrees Celsius. 89 degrees Fahrenheit. One of the first immediately noticed traits about Site C is an array of immobile pylons, which encircle what is believed to be the entirety of the site. Separated by an apparent distance of 5 to 6 meters, each pylon appears to be 2 to 4 infected persons fused together in one spot. On some of these pylons, features such as faces or anuses are still visible, in addition to several other holes which do not naturally occur, all appearing to act as heat vents. Where the heat is generated is unknown. Current belief is that this is an advanced stage of SCP-610 terraforming its environment to facilitate spread of itself. DI-2, who was furthest along in progression of SCP-610 of the three by a number of hours, begins to seizure after only a few minutes in Site-C during examination of the pylons. The progression to the scar tissue phase of SCP-610 infection is observed in full course as DI-2 spasms on the ground, his entire body being overtaken by the sickly tanned flesh almost entirely after 45 seconds. DI-2 is terminated by a gunshot from DI-1, and his equipment left where it is. The spread of SCP-610 over DI-2 continues even after death of the body until all movement ceases. The spread of SCP-610 over DI-2 continues, even after death of the body, until all movement ceases. As Perimeter Control is relaying new instructions to DI-1 and DI-3 regarding this situation, there is a shift in the ground covering in Site C where DI-2's body is. Video feed shows the flesh-like growth splitting open beneath his body, and a series of ropey tendrils coming from within the gap to pull his corpse inside. This opening closes up quickly. Total time elapsed. Three seconds. As DI-1 and DI-3 decide to act quickly in these hotter temperatures fearing the same fate, they proceed to the village center and encounter another previously unknown phenomenon. In the precise center of town rising above what was the community well is a sphere suspended by angled supports comprised of SCP-610 flesh. The ball is riddled with the features of humans in early stages of SCP-610 infection, as well as a good number assumed to be in later stages. A number of specimens of non-human life forms such as deer and bears are also visible within the mass. The entire sphere of flesh pulses at roughly a 5 second interval, and with each pulse emits a ring of spore-like material from its equator. This material floats to the ground, and appears to be absorbed into the converted environment. 
DI-3 begins to douse the sphere with the provided gasoline, and when questioned by a panicking DI-1, explains this looks like as good a thing to burn as any. At this point, perimeter control has ceased giving commands due to the rapid deterioration of events. There is no reaction from anything within Site C to any of this activity until the precise moment at which a lit emergency flare is applied to the spherical mass, which immediately goes up in flames. The remote feed plays back a noise from an unknown location that seems to come from a location far outside of Site C, but was reported as being heard even at perimeter control by both Sites C and A. This noise is described as both explosive, as if multiple high-yield charges were detonated on a mountainside, and alive, like a large feral creature roaring. Within 15 seconds following this sound's dissipation, Site A reported that a series of explosions had occurred within the village. Five seconds after this report, the spherical mass in the center of Site C explodes. DI-1 and DI-3 are thrown by the blast. DI-3 is confirmed deceased by DI-1 after regaining his footing, having suffered injury from stone shrapnel from the well. DI-1 is able to report he has bruises and ringing ears, but aside from the rapidly spreading SCP-610 infection, he suffered no blast damage. During this recording of footage, DI-1 had his video equipment removed and was looking into it. Due to the angle of recording, it is unknown precisely what occurred in Site C, but something draws DI-1's attention back to the center of town, where he stares for several moments, then is pulled in the opposite direction, the video equipment falling to the ground and recording in a skyward direction. The last moments of footage from DI-1's video unit display a humanoid figure moving through the air, followed by the sound of an impact in the same direction. Within three seconds of this event, an unknown creature steps upon the recording video equipment and destroys it. Perimeter controls remained on high alert for a full 24 hours at all locations, without any incident following this event. Proceed to next document, SCP-610-L3.